I am probably the most guilty of this. Libertarians are great at the change, but not good at the hope. We know exactly what we're against. As the great meme maker David Cox recently posted uh, a Facebook comment from a young libertarian going, wait, I thought libertarianism was the hate of government. And sometimes it feels like we've gotten really, really good at hating the government and everything's about the government and what should the government do or not do. And we forget to articulate what the world would look like if we got our worldview enacted. And so I want to start with your background because I think you have presented a great model in a lot of ways. So like, let's start with where you're from. Like, what's your origin story? Tell us a little bit about where you started and, and where you're from. Yeah, well, I am from Chicago, Illinois, and I am the son of a preacher man. My father's mm -hmm. a pastor, and um, you know, for me, there isn't a point in my life where I, you know, I can recall not being immersed in a church community where everybody there was constantly thinking about issues like what does it mean to live the good life? What does it mean to live a meaningful life? Um, what are our duties to society? And is it even appropriate to think about our relationship to society in a way that is duty bound? You know, so all of the philosophical questions of life, I grew up in a context where these were being wrestled with and, and taken very seriously as literally a matter of life and death. But I'll tell you one thing I'm, I'm very proud of. One thing that means a lot to me is that my father never raised me to be a statist. There are many people who, when they talk about their political journey, they, they reference having a red pill experience. Well, that comes from the matrix, right? That comes from the fact that when someone was unplugged from this matrix of illusion, this system of, of enslavement, uh, and they were enlightened about the truth of the real world, they were given the opportunity to take the blue pill where they kind of go back to their previous life or the red pill where they, they, they kind of see reality for how it really is. And they realize that, you know, this system that that pretends to be an ally or that pretends to be the real world is actually a system of coercion designed for their enslavement. Well, there's a character in the matrix, many characters in the matrix who are known as children of Zion. And when, when, when you look at the back of their heads, they don't have that hook in the back of their heads because they were never plugged into the matrix. And when it comes to politics, I consider myself a child of Zion. I never had to take the red pill because I have never at any point in my life been a statist. I don't have a conversion story. I've been a political atheist ever since I was a child. I define a political atheist as a non-believer in the salvific power of the political process, as a non-believer in, the, in the, the legitimacy of the right to rule. I've never believed that, never at any point in my life that I think that was a reasonable idea. And you know, when my parents raised me on Bible stories, they taught me to look at the scriptures through that non-statist lens. So for instance, if you take a look at the story of Moses, if you've seen the Prince of Egypt, or if you've actually read the Bible, the book of Exodus, um, you, know, you, you know that Moses was the prophet and Pharaoh was the politician. And the politician was the guy that was responsible for instituting this system of slavery. Mm -hmm. And the reason that he did it is because he looked at all of these people and he says, you know, these people are gonna become powerful. They're gonna realize what they're capable of. We better launch a preemptive strike and enslave these people. That's what the politician did, right? And, and the prophet was the one who brought a message that said, let us do away with this system of coercion. Let my people go. That was one of the first lessons I learned as a child, that wherever freedom comes from, it doesn't come from politicians. Just like Pharaoh, politicians go with the tide when there's too much pressure in that direction. Politicians are a lagging indicator, as has often been said before me, of the change that occurs within the hearts and minds of everyday ordinary individuals like you and I. And when people say, I've had enough of this coercion, I'm not going to take it anymore. I will be treated with respect. I demand respect. Well, then politicians, they will dance to that tune, but only when they have to, just like Pharaoh. You know, he went down in flames trying to resist and resist people's freedom. So they only respect freedom when it's politically profitable for them to do so. But anyway, that's what I was taught. That was my upbringing. And so it's not that my family grew up talking about politics a lot or, or complaining about the, the, the latest politician or political scandal. We grew up not even talking about that. We grew up talking about things like what we were doing as individuals to make our communities better, what we were doing to spread the good news, 
that human beings are creative expressions of the divine and have the power to impact their world, regardless of who's in office. And so I've carried that with me. And, 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 I, and I have a heart like my dad's, you know, I consider myself an evangelist of the philosophy of freedom, you know, because I do believe that this message is a matter of life and death. I believe that everything hinges upon it because if we don't have freedom, we don't have anything else. There's nothing that matters more. So that's where I come from. That's how I was brought up. 